Welcome back. This is Eric Hyatt again, and this is the second installment in the video series for Oceanography 328, 528, from the University of Wisconsin in beautiful Oshkosh, Wisconsin. This video discusses the beginnings of understanding ocean basins and the development of the plate tectonic theory. This is a very interesting topic, and we better dive right in. Ocean basins and plate tectonics, or I should say the origin of plate tectonic theory comes from ocean basins. Maybe that would be a better way to say that. But to start out this topic, let's start with ocean basins themselves and how we came to understand what they represent and what they are. That involves linking back to some of the earlier parts of the course where we essentially discussed the evolution of scientific thought and the history of science and technology that led to the scientific revolution of understanding plate tectonics. So let's start with ocean basins and early beliefs and discoveries. And we can start again with your friend and mine, Benjamin Franklin was the first person to actually map or plot an ocean current on a map. We talked about this before, here's the Gulf Stream. And this was used, you can see the little ships on here, this was used to help understand how to get back and forth between North America and, and Europe. But let's go back to Benjamin Franklin's time and look at some of the other information that was coming out at that time. And this is a map drawn by Sir Edmund Halley of Halley's Comet fame. This is a plot of the much more accurate longitude and latitude and location data for the continents. And so for the first time we're getting a much more accurate representation of the shape of continents and the position of the continents. So we could, there was a development in technology, cutting edge technology, that allowed this, this much more accurate mapping of continental coasts and the, the positions of islands and continents and that was a clock. In the 1700s, uh, the British developed a much bit more accurate clock that would actually work on the oceans. Because if you remember back, you need to know time very accurately to, to have accurate locations in terms of longitude. Very accurately, you need to know the time very accurately. So an inventor in England developed a clock that would actually work on a moving ship. So clocks of the day kept time by using a pendulum swinging back and forth, which doesn't work very well when you're rocking back and forth on a ship. The development of this chronometer to very accurately keep time on a ship allowed the British to m make much more accurate maps and determine their positions much more accurately than anybody else. And so the maps coming out from that time period were much, much better. People like Benjamin Franklin, who are very intelligent and creative, looked at these maps and said, Africa and South America looks like they must have fit together at one point, and the continents must have split apart. They look like pieces of a puzzle. It's very circumstantial evidence, but based on that, Benjamin Franklin wrote some interesting thoughts in terms of what that might mean, and he essentially uh, predicted plate tectonic theory. And if you look at this last comment down here, the surface of the globe would be a shell capable of being broken and distorted by violent movements of the fluid on which it rested. I mean, that's plate tectonics, plate tectonic theory. The, he didn't know what the fluid was. He assumed that there must be some hot molten area inside the earth. We know that today as the asthenosphere that weak, partially molten portion of the upper mantle on which the rigid part, the shell, in Benjamin Franklin's terms, the crust and the lithosphere move with respect to each other. Benjamin Franklin, go figure. He predicted plate tectonics too. So let's start with early beliefs about how the ocean basins came to be and their nature. And the first one was that the deep oceans would be flat and featureless and lifeless. Remember back to Forbes' Azoic Zone. 
anything greater than 1800 feet depth, uh, there would be no life. It would just be dark and, and no life there. Second point is that it was assumed that the ocean basins were the age of the earth and they would have sediments accumulated that started accumulated when the earth formed. And so you'd have the entire record of the earth recorded in sediments on the seafloor. If you could just dig down through them or drill down through them, you'd have the whole record of the earth right there on the seafloor. Now, in the 1600s, 1700s, people thought that the earth was maybe 6,000 years old, 10,000 years old, maybe a million years old. Many geologists at the time that were studying fossils realized that you needed a lot of time to fit in all the fossil record that they were discovering in ancient rocks on the continents. So they were starting to think that the earth was maybe tens of millions of years old, but certainly not billions of years old. But the idea was that on the seafloor, you'd have the entire record of life and the history of the earth in the sediments on the seafloor, if you could just access them. Many scientists and naturalists expected that the solid rock underneath the sediment on the seafloor would be crystalline rock, just like you see on the continents. And so that would be things like uh, this igneous rock granite, which is made up of gray glassy quartz and white potassium and sodium plagioclase feldspar and some pink potassium feldspar. And then these distinctive black minerals are mostly biotite, black mica, and sometimes hornblende. This very silica, silicon, oxygen, sodium, aluminum rich uh, rock with a very interlocking crystal texture. This is a scan of a piece of granite countertop that I had. And so here's a scale, one centimeter for scale. People assume that's what would be on the seafloor or perhaps the metamorphic version of a granite and sedimentary rock would be a gneiss, like pronounced like gneiss. It has bands of quartz and potassium feldspar and plagioclase feldspar and bands that are rich in black mica and hornblende. And this one actually has red areas that are degraded areas of garnet, metamorphic mineral. But that's what people expected to find because that's the type of crystalline rock that they found on the continents. Yeah, there was some basalt around, but not very much. is relatively rare on the continents. So the prediction was that the underneath the seafloor would be crystalline rocks just like they see on the continent. Let's and talk about some of the discoveries that led to understanding ocean basins and actually led to the plate tectonic theory. I've emphasized this a few times throughout the semester. People that were working 100, 200, 300 and more years ago were very, very smart. Maybe smart as you. Whatever. Or maybe even smarter than you and me. Very, very bright people. They had what they had as far as data and technology. We have, you know, technology develops and we get more and more discoveries and data to build scientific understanding of the earth and the universe. Put yourself in their shoes, get you to do that several times throughout the semester. Put yourself in the shoes of people that were working two, 300 years ago and let's try to think forward instead of looking backwards. We have this plate tectonic theory with beautiful color cartoons and we can kind of look back and think, oh, why didn't they see that? Well, they didn't really have the data at the time. So let's start with depth measurements and the depth and the shape of the seafloor. And let's start with that mountain range in the center of the ocean basins, especially the Atlantic, almost dead center in the Atlantic is something today we call the mid-ocean ridge. It's a mountain range on the seafloor and it starts to take shape in the 1850s. Remember Maori in the 1850s. We consider him the first true oceanographer. He put together a big atlas, a book on the oceans, including seafloor shape, seafloor depth, uh, temperature, salinity data, currents, and all the understanding at the time and it turned out to be for what they had was quite good and quite accurate so Maori was a naval officer in the US Navy in 1853 he started it all off by publishing a book and one of the figures in the book 
was this bathymetric map. One of the figures in the book was this bathymetric map or topography of the seafloor in the North Atlantic. And so here's for reference, here's Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, AKA the rock. In the east coast of the US, here's a kind of ragged looking Florida, Gulf of Mexico. And then over here is Portugal and Spain, Iberian Peninsula, just for reference, and West Africa, the Sahara Desert right in here, the western part of it. And then in the deep Atlantic, what he's done is all these little numbers with spots, those are sounding measurements, depths, you can't read them on this figure, but that's okay. And then he's contoured those rough, sometimes sparse data points and made topographic highs. So he called this the dolphin rise, dolphin rise. We call it the mid-ocean ridge. He's got it figured, he, so he's got it kind of delineated here in the North Atlantic. It's a little wide, but look, it, there's not a lot of data in here. So he's just contouring what he had, and he didn't extend it down this way because he has no data. So he, rather than extrapolate it all the way down here, he just closed it off and said, here's, here's the high point in the Atlantic. Pretty amazing that he could do that and that he did it. Kind of gutsy, isn't it? The depth measurements uh, or soundings improved with the Challenger expedition in the 1870s. Of course, I mentioned to you it's a good lesson in data collection. And if you do a master's thesis, you don't want to bite off more than you can chew, which is what the Challenger expedition did. They generated so much data about the global oceans with lots of depth measurements, temperature, salinity, life, seafloor sediments, winds, currents. It took them 20 years. So in the 1890s, they actually published the results and it was in that massive volume of books. I showed you, it's, it fills a bookcase, and it was rather unwieldy, because you couldn't Google it, right? You had to actually go and have a copy and look through the tons and tons of data and information. What they did was they had a lot more sounding data, and they were able to show that there are mountain ranges essentially in every ocean basin. And, and what they did, they didn't say this, but what they did was they showed that the mid-ocean ridge system is actually global. First big important discovery for understanding ocean basins in, in, from this expedition. They collected lots of animal specimens from the deep ocean, thousands of feet, way below uh, Forbes's Azoic zone. So they're, that's gone now, hopefully. And then whenever they pulled up rock from the seafloor, whenever they pulled up crystalline rock from the seafloor, it was this weird igneous rock basalt. It wasn't granite. It was never nice. That's funny. It was never nice. It, it was not nice. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. It was always basalt. And it's basalt that's glassy, broken, and very altered. It's a mess. And they didn't understand why. They had no clue why. They, they looked at this and they said, why is it always basalt? Why not granite? Why not sedimentary rock? Why not metamorphic rock like we see on the continents? Why is it always this distinctive iron and magnesium rich, silica poor, igneous rock that is basalt? No clue why, just another discovery Everybody's scratching their heads, like, what is this stuff? Then in the 1920s, the German meteor expedition that we, we spoke about earlier, important expedition in, in terms of scientific discovery, but also it had some secret geopolitical military aspects to it too. They put their best chemist on the ship to try to extract gold from seawater. We know him, um, he's not really my friend, but um, Fritz Haber and because he became very good at making nitrogen compounds to blow people up a little bit later. And yeah, anyway, they developed sonar, a much better sonar system, and they took many more depth measurements. And now they're actually using sound to make soundings for depth measurements. And every five to 20 miles in the Atlantic using their, their early primitive, but it was the latest, greatest thing at the time, uh, sonar. And then in the 1950s, the Atlantis expeditions were academic expeditions from the East Coast, from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and through Columbia University in New York State in the 1950s. 
they had a much better sonar system, not as good as the military, and it's important to realize we're in, in 1950s context, we're in the Cold War. The military had a lot of detailed maps from sonar data on the seafloor because they were interested in finding and tracking submarines, like Soviet submarines, but that was considered top secret data. So that was not released until the 1990s. So academic institutions to scientifically study the oceans had to go out and generate their own data and basically duplicating what the military was doing. So using government funds to basically duplicate what had already been done. And they were guided by a geophysicist by the name of Morris Ewing. He was interested in the nature and the origin of the mountain range that makes up the mid-ocean ridge. He had studied all the historical data from the meteor expedition and he was able to get funding for the Atlantis expeditions to do more detailed mapping of the seafloor across the mid-ocean ridges. Morris Ewing was giving presentations about his research across the country, kind of a speaking tour, and he did a presentation at the University of Iowa, and there was an undergraduate student who was finishing up at the University of Iowa in the geology department by the name of Bruce Heason. Bruce Heason was raised on a chicken farm in Iowa, but he had always been interested in the ocean, and Ewing's presentation sparked his interest in terms of what this mountain range could be in the deep ocean. And it turns out that when he graduated, he went to work for Ewing as a graduate student at Columbia University. And the two of them set out to use this depth data from these historical expeditions to understand or delineate the mid-ocean ridge system in the Atlantic. They needed somebody who could visualize and who could bring this data to life and, and basically put it on a map to represent the data to get the big picture. So they hired Marie Tharp, who just graduated with her geology degree in the 1950s, and they hired her basically to be a mapping drafts person, drafting the figures and drafting the, the maps, taking the depth data and the profiles and plotting them on maps, large scale, ocean basin scale maps. Working with Heason to draw the, the maps of the mid-ocean ridge system, and she was working and she discovered something very interesting. She discovered a valley system running down the axis of the, of the Atlantic mid-ocean ridge. Here's Marie Tharp in the 1950s, and she's got some of these profiles. And this is an interesting one. It, it's, it has a very high vertical exaggeration. It's very stretched in the vertical, so it exaggerates the hills and the valleys, so you can see those better. But that's the type of data that she was working with. She took these profiles and she made maps and it basically extrapolated around the profiles with similar kind of topography. And so in some ways you could consider these really not maps. They're really more like characterizations of the seafloor. You might not find all the little details at, if you go off of a major feature, the other minor features around it might be there or might not be there. She was essentially painting on the topography of the seafloor. But let's look at some of these profiles in a little bit more detail. So here's some of these horizontal basin scale topographic profiles or bathymetric profiles for depth. And let's look at that in a little bit more detail. And so there's that figure with Marie Tharp sitting here. And here's some of these profiles. And she noticed something very interesting that some of these profiles over the peak of the ridge has a little a valley in it, a little depression in it, and it's very V-shaped and it's very steep on this kind of a scale. And it's not always really distinctive, it's not always symmetrical, and partly it's because of the quality of the data, and, it's, and these are linear uh, path across a three-dimensional structure, and so it's not necessarily picking up all the detail. But she saw these, these little valley systems on these ridges and she thought that that was pretty consistent in the profiles and she went to the guys Ewing and Heason and said hey guys this is really important there's this valley system on this mid-ocean ridge 
And of course, they're guys. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's very interesting, but it's really not necessarily there. You know, go back and work on your maps. Keep going. You're doing a great job. And that's it. But she persisted and she said, no, no, this is this is real. And I see this in more and more of the data and it must represent something. It's telling us something about the nature of the ridges. It turns out it's true. And she, Marie Tharp, by persisting and standing up for what she what she had discovered, had basically discovered the axial valley system of the mid-ocean ridge. And that became a really important uh, part of the plate tectonic puzzle. And here's that valley system. It's offset by these cross-cutting faults. These are called transform faults. And they result from trying to spread, we know now, they didn't know then, they result from trying to spread hor horizontally, not on a flat surface like a map, but on a sphere. You've got to have offsets and breaks to make that work. And so what she plotted here on this characterization from 1970, this is from the National Geographic, and these characterizations were plotted in color foldouts that, you, that would come out of the magazine, and they're very famous, but she plotted a very distinctive axial valley system right up the center of the mid-ocean ridge. Two things to keep in mind with this diagram. Is it a map or not? Some people say it's not a map, it's a characterization because on these early these early figures, she essentially had to paint in, extrapolate from where they had lots of data. So it's almost like a lot of artistic license. Some of the big features, most of the big features like the, the these extinct volcanoes and these highs on the seafloor, those are well known and they were located and they're, they're pretty exact where they are. A lot of the small minor features on this figure break through. Uh, it was an important leap forward in our understanding of the ocean basins. The second thing to keep in mind, look at the steepness of the continental margin here and look at the steepness of these mountains on the seafloor, these extinct volcanoes, this has been vertically exaggerated many, many times. So it's stretched vertically. In a way to kind of compare, here's the Appalachians on land and they didn't really stretch those up into giant mountains. So it's been exaggerated upward. And looking at those mountains on the continents is a good comparison. So you have, so we have an axial valley system on a mountain range in the center of the Atlantic. We know that the only crystalline rock that's been extracted and pulled up and sampled from the mid-ocean ridge is basalt. We have all these aspects of the setting and the geology, but we don't really have an understanding of the, all these pieces of puzzle. People recognize that basalt can be found on volcanoes like Hawaii and volcanoes on land like some places in the western US, and there was that definite association, but we didn't really have an understanding of what the ridges represent. What helped was in the 1960s study of these valley systems. It was being studied because there are volcanoes and there are earthquakes and things like that. There was an additional reason to study this valley system and that was the discovery of early hominid fossils by the team of Lewis and Mary Leakey, archeologists, anthropologists, who were excavating early proto-human hominid fossils in this valley system. And they were wondering what the nature of the environments were in which these early hominids were living. So they're sometimes found in volcanic rocks, like volcanic ash and pumice and volcanic fragments, but also sediments, usually lake sediments. And so they wondered what this was, and it helped foster a scientific study, a geological study, of what the East African Rift System represents. And so geologists started studying the East African Rift and realized that it was pulling apart and there are volcanic rocks essentially associated with the structural pulling apart of the continental crust of East Africa. And then it was very quickly realized that it's also pulling apart and spreading. Then the Red Sea is a spreading center 
the Saudi Arabian Peninsula is moving to the east and Africa is moving to the west. And then there's a interesting triangular intersection here of the Gulf of Aden and it is spreading apart too. So this, these, these discoveries, this understanding and this data, people started to realize that possibly the axial valley system in the mid-ocean ridge is actually a rifting, spreading, analogous to the East African rift system. So these different discoveries, different kind of scientific fields driving and these bits of information coming together to develop an understanding. So finally in this series, Ewing and Heesen in the 1960s used the more accurate global seismic data that was becoming available from global seismic networks to plot the position of the epicenters of earthquakes. And in the Atlantic, almost all of them fall in the axial valley of the mid-ocean ridge. There are a few off to the side, but it's concentrated in the axial valley system, which is a really bizarre thing. And if, so if we look at the distribution of global earthquakes shown in red here, and focus on the North Atlantic to start out with, they form a narrow band of red earthquake epicenter locations. And when you plot them up with the mid-ocean ridge and axial valley, they fall right in the axial valley. There are some that are off along those transform faults that splay off and cross cut the mid-ocean ridge system, but they're largely concentrated in the axial valley system on the mid-ocean ridge. It gets messier when you get to the Pacific Ocean. This is called the East Pacific Rise. That's the mid-ocean that's the mid-ocean ridge system in the Pacific. It's offset to the the eastern part of of the Pacific Ocean basin and they're more spread out and it turns out they didn't know this, but the mid-ocean ridge system in the Pacific is actually spreading a lot faster, double the rate of the Atlantic and it makes the ridge more diffuse. And in fact, there's not a well-defined axial valley system on the East Pacific rise because of the greater rate of spreading and uplift from the heat flux. And they didn't know that. In fact, Marie Tharp's first characterizations for the Pacific, mistakenly, she sketched in what must be there. She thought it must be there, an axial valley system. And so the very earliest 1970 version of her figures for the Pacific Ocean Basin are wrong. They took it out later, but in that first version, that's all they knew. They thought it should be there, so they sketched one in. So it's there. The wide, intense bands of earthquakes around the Pacific particularly, but other places, are locations of convergent plate boundaries. We'll talk about that in the next couple lectures, but this is ocean crust being forced under the continent, under the continent along South America, under the, continent, under the continental crust of the Central America and under ocean crust in the North Pacific. And what this tells you is, you know, you really shouldn't live on a convergent plate boundary. It's a dangerous place to live. These early discoveries led to an understanding of ocean basins and these bits and pieces of the puzzle are starting to come together where we can develop the plate tectonic theory. But we've got a ways to go but it's a really interesting journey and I think we need to get to the next video and the next section. So let's dive into that.